Now, the last few games, for those who have not been present for the last few speedrun games, in the last game we faced the Karokan, I blundered a piece. I blundered a piece. And then we managed to recover and win. Bonus. Okay, we're wide against Decode. I mean, again, we've been toggling between Jababa London and 1E4, but let's switch back to our main repertoire and go for E4, especially because we're facing the center counter, also known as the Scandinavian, which I believe is the first time that we have faced it in the speedrun. Okay, Knight F6. This is less popular than Queen takes D5, which is the sort of more in the spirit of the Scandi. I don't know if Knight F6 has a name. Apparently, it's called the modern variation. Uh, there is something called the Portuguese Gambit, I want to say, which goes D4, Bishop G4. But many years ago, uh, many, many, many years ago, around 2005, 2006, one of my first coaches taught me a line uh, that essentially avoids a lot of the theory uh, of the Portuguese Gambit uh, and some of the trickier lines. And it gives white not as big of an advantage as you would get if you played the absolute principled stuff, but... What I like is that it just gives you an easy to play position and it avoids a lot of the theory. So the line goes like this, and I've done this before on a previous speeder, and I remember that we faced this. You deliver a check on b5, which should, ma should make a lot of sense to you. I mean, it's a developing move, and you're forcing a piece to appear on d7, which by definition uh, is severing the connection between the black queen and the pawn on d5. And fundamentally, there are two approaches to playing this position. You could try to cling to the d5 pawn. So what you could try to do here is play bishop takes d7, queen takes d7, and c4. And a lot of less experienced players would gravitate toward that. But I'll show you a couple of analogs after the game. This approach in many openings is not good because after black plays c6, he attains massive compensation positionally for the pawn in the form of dominance over key central squares. And it's just not an easy position to play. So the move that my coach taught me is to drop the bishop actually back to e2. The point is you give away the d5 pawn, and now you occupy the center with d4, and you get a slight advantage in an easy-to-play position. What was the point of this whole operation with bishop b5, bishop b2? Well, it was just to force black's bishop to appear on d7. You might say, well, why are we forcing? Isn't it good for black to develop a piece? Well, not quite, because the bishop on d7 is a very awkward piece. It's Again, it's cutting the connection between the black queen and the center, it's preventing the knight from accessing that square. It's just not developed on a good square. So that is why in this line, you often see experienced Scandi players actually reposition the bishop on f5. c5, I've never seen before. It's a very sensible move. My guess is that if we take on c5, black wants to give queen a5 check and then pick up the pawn and really contest our control over the center. So there are several ways that we can fight this move. We can ignore it and just keep developing our pieces. But if possible, I, I don't just want to give away our d4 pawn without a fight. Now, in the Alapin Sicilian, there is a similar type of idea that involves pushing c4 and then driving the pawn into d5 and establishing a more, a firmer presence in the center, which I think makes a lot of sense here. I think we should go c4 and counterattack Black's Knight. Our opponent is still playing instantly, which tells me that he pro this is probably some sort of obscure theory. Now, here again, d takes c5 is not stupid because we, what we could say is, okay, we're, we're not trying to win a pawn. We're trying to gain a bunch of tempi for development. So after queen a5 check, there's one tempo. And then when black takes on c5, there's another tempo. We could play bishop e3 and then essentially complete our minor piece development with knight f3. So that, I think, is a great approach as well. So I like the look of d takes c5. But d5 is what we initially planned to do. So I think we should stick to our guns here and play d5. e6. Okay. So here, the instinct of most people, I think, is to play knight c3 and then to meet ed with cd. But the problem is that when that pawn chain turns into an isolated pawn, our strategy loses a lot of its luster because the d5 pawn becomes more of a liability than a strength. So I think... A more prudent approach here is actually to take on e6, which I know is a little bit anticlimactic because we did all of this and now we're just giving away our center. But if you look concretely, it should make some more sense. DE, if black plays FE, well, obviously that ruins black structure. We're happy. If black plays bishop takes e6, 
Then we're able to trade queens and force black's king onto a very awkward square on d8, which we could use as fuel for our subsequent development. And you should be familiar with this general concept where essentially you're able to castle queenside with check. I'm sure you've probably done this in other openings. And I think that white has a very small but a very stable edge in the endgame. And we haven't had that many endgames in general, so... I wanted an excuse to play an endgame. Okay, clearly this tells me that our opponent is not in preparation. This is just complete bluff. And he's playing this like a bullet game. Because FE is a very bad move, I think. Now black is saddled with permanent weakness of the E6 pawn. And of course, when black castles kingside, the kingside is not going to be quite as safe of a place as it used to be. But let's speed up a little bit. I don't want to lose on time. So now... The next stage is for us to just develop our pieces really in any order. I don't think it particularly matters in what order we develop our pieces. We do want to protect the d4 square so that black doesn't quickly establish a knight on d4, but we just do that by playing knight f3. Let's start Let's start with knight c3. It, it doesn't matter. Now we'll play knight f3, gain a little bit of time, and now we'll castle. We can just basically play automatically here uh, these next couple of moves. But then we should take a moment to think because this bishop... We can develop it to many different spots, and this is an important decision uh, where we develop our bishop. I, I see at least four options, actually. Bishop b3, bishop f4, bishop g5, and let's not forget about the queenside fianchetto. We can play b3 and bishop b2. Now, let's take the opposite view. What is black likely to do here? Well, one annoying idea is for black to try to utilize this pawn effectively to push it up to e5, and to establish an outpost for the knight on d4. That is a positional weak, well, not a weakness, but that is a risk uh, that we need to we need to fight. I, 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 don't, I don't think we should allow black to establish an outpost on d4, because if we trade on d4, then the pawn is replaced, uh, the knight is replaced by a very annoying pawn, much like our pawn on d5, and we won't have the machinery available to contest that pawn. So for that reason, I like bishop f4, because it's prophylactic. Now, you might look at this move and say, well, I don't like the fact that we're stepping into the x-ray of the rook. But an x-ray in and of itself isn't all that bad. We have to check to see if black has discoveries. Unfortunately, I think there is what I would call a positional discovery, which is a discovered attack that is not intended to win a piece. It is intended to engineer a favorable trade, by which I mean black has this weird move, knight f6 to e4. And after we take on e4, black is able to eliminate the dark squared bishop and make it easier for himself to secure the knight on d4. So bishop f4 has a bit of a, I don't know whether to call it a tactical or positional drawback. Let me keep thinking for a minute, for a moment. So if we're not playing bishop f4, we might want to resort to b3. We also might want to play bishop to e3, even though it looks a little bit more passive. Bishop to g5 is also possible here. From the perspective of, like, safest developing square, I think, let's play bishop g5. Let's just play the sort of most straightforward textbook developing move. And if our opponent plays e5, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Okay, obviously bishop h4 is the typical retreating move. Knight h5, which is, I, I kind of expected this, actually. Now, let's evaluate this positionally. Well, positionally, it leaves black after the trade of dark squared bishops, which, by the way, we are not forced to engage in. We can drop the bishop back to g3. People often forget about this prospect. But the thing is, then we give black the bishop pair, and this bishop from e7 can reposition itself to f6. And again, we're fighting for control of the d4 square. That is the sort of unstated battle in this position. So from that perspective, we should take on e7. And here we need to think, what does black want? Well, black wants at least two things. There is this old idea, e5, knight, d4. It's less scary now because e5 can be met with knight to d5 and we get an outpost of our own. The scarier prospect is knight to f4. So you might come up with the idea of g3, but g3 weakens our king side a little bit. So I wouldn't want to make this move unless we were sort of desperate. Well, not desperate. And, and really, it's not that weakening. It's really not that weakening because the dark, the light squared bishop for black is not able to access key squares g4 and h3. Furthermore, after g3, we create this potential idea of knight to h4 when the knight has access to the forkable square on g6. g3, I like the look of a little bit more than rook to e1, which would be my other candidate move here, in order to meet knight f4 with bishop f1 which is another idea that you should absolutely be fully aware of. But I just don't like the option of allowing the knight 
to land on f4. So I think we're going to play more drastically here. Okay, our opponent is still playing instantly. And actually not badly at all. I think I'm... I, I wouldn't say that white is more than very slightly better here. Now, the problem is that if we play knight h4, I'm shocked that our opponent saw this that quickly. It took me a while. Black can respond with knight to f4. And that is a typical tactic that occurs sometimes in King's Indian positions. I'll show you after the game. Knight h4, knight f4, and the pawn on g3 is overloaded. If we take f4, we lose h4. And of course, the point of knight f4 is to protect the g6 square. So what I think we should do here is just continue making small but meaningful improvements to our position. What would those meaningful improvements look like? Well, first and foremost, I mean, we could deploy our rook and put it on e1, which I think is a relatively risk-free way of improving our position. Now, it has its drawbacks in the form of weakening the f2 pawn. So if black's queen repositions onto the f file, we would have to be careful, but black doesn't do that. He plays knight f6. We need to continue improving our position. We need to continue improving our position. One move that I kind of like is bishop to d3 in order to make space for our queen to move into e2. Yeah, but, but that also puts the bishop in the line of fire of black's rook. A more measured positional approach would involve would involve redirecting our bishop to the Fianchetto square on g2, which would solve the problem of some of our kingside weaknesses, but is a little bit passive. Hmm. Not easy, actually. This is this guy is incredible. Let's, th let's think about this for a second. Knight h4, also good. But then that gives up the d4 square. Queen c2, also interesting. Yeah, I like the look of queen c2 to develop the queen. But again, that runs into knight d4. Again, that runs into knight d4, and I don't love that. Hmm. It's a weird position. I mean, white should be better here, but somehow I don't love it because of this d4 square. We're struggling because of the weakness of that square. Knight f6 is an amazing move, actually. It makes it very hard for me to find a move. Okay, I guess... Queen c2, knight d4, knight d4, cd, knight d4. I don't know why I've been struggling so much these last few speedrun games. I feel like I'm getting soundly outplayed. Okay, let's play bishop f1. Let's play bishop f1 and adopt a more defensive posture. Bishop e8. Okay, queen c1, I guess. Because, again, I didn't want to play queen c2 because it walks into knight d4 with tempo. Queen c1, at least if black plays knight d4, we have time to react, and we can actually sink our teeth into e5 as a result. Um, if black plays bishop h5, then I think, okay, knight g4, I'm probably getting crushed here. Let's think for a moment. Bishop g2 was the idea. Of course, that's the whole point of why we played bishop f1, in order to get this bishop to g2 and knight to d4. Okay, knight to d4 I don't find to be scary, actually. It looks scary, but I don't think it is. Simply because we can take on d4. I think it's a mistake. I th and, uh, and now, this scenario looks very scary. Now, you might be tempted by rook takes e6, queen takes e6, and bishop to d5. But unfortunately, that tactic fails. Black can play rook takes d5. And when the smoke clears, black is simply up a piece. You might also be tempted by knight d5, but you shouldn't get distracted. We're trying to defend here. Knight to d5, queen f7, and you can drop the knight to f4, but it'll be chased away with the move e5. So again, you want to be defensive here. Knight e4 is the move because this defends the f2 pawn. And on the next move, we might chase black's knight away with h3. Man, I didn't know one could play chess this fast and this well, but I learn new things every day. Still, I think white is fine. This is probably equal. I really don't know where I went wrong. It feels like I made a mistake somewhere. We'll analyze afterward. This will be a good learning experience for me as well. So there is a move I'm scared of here. I won't say what it is. I'll tell you if... Yes, that is exactly the move. <laughs> okay. Um, because it threatens bishop e4 and knight takes f2. All right. So rook e2, d3, rook d2... Okay, I'm in serious danger of losing this game, so I'm going to focus. Okay, I have an idea. Let's go queen d2. Let's go queen d2. So here's my idea. I'm trying to lure, 
I'm trying to lure black into playing bishop takes e4. Rook takes e4. Rook takes f2. And then I'm hoping that what black doesn't see is that when we drop our queen back, let's say, to e1, black is facing twin threats. Rook takes g4. And it's a classic scenario where if the knight moves, the, the rook on f2 is hanging. So, no, black seems to... I, I think our opponent is totally legit. I mean, I am getting completely outplayed, but it, it happens. I'm not mistake-free. I've been saying that since the start of the speedrun. I'll probably lose a game. You know, one, one out of every 500 games, I'm going to get outplayed. So, I don't see any reason to be suspicious yet. Rook takes g2, king takes g2. No, no. I mean, I'll put it this way. If our opponent plays perfectly the rest of the game, okay, then we'll 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 look at it, but so far I've just I I really I feel like all of my moves have been very natural and I've gotten totally outplayed, but that just happens when you make a mistake. That's just the product of making a mistake. There is a move here that I'm terrified of. If our opponent plays it, I'll tell you what it is. It is a very high level move. It is a very high level move. Let's see if our opponent actually plays it. He's probably calculating bishop takes e4. I won't say the move. Just in case. I mean, I never say like a move that scares me, just, just in case. That's just sort of speedrun policy. Yeah, this move causes a lot of problems. But it doesn't win. I mean, it just it leads to a good position for black, but it doesn't win the game immediately. It's not this move. I think knight e5 was big problems for white. But no, that he seems totally legit to me so far. Rook takes e4, rook f2. Okay, so he goes for this line. He goes for this line, and I'm very curious what it is that he wants. Probably he wants to sack the exchange after rook takes g2 and go for... I have, oh, I have to record the Warriors game. And go for the weakness of our king, essentially. At least the start of it. But I have no choice. We have to play queen e1. And rook takes g2. But I don't find this to be terrifying. And there's two reasons for that. Let me explain the reasons that I don't find that to be... Uh, it's scary, but not terrifying. We can bail out. And probably we should bail out. Probably we should bail out. Because our king is permanently weak. The knight on e3 is super strong. Also, I realize the black has knight to c2. So... Without question, we have to bail out by playing rook takes e3 and queen takes e3. And white is not worse here. I refuse to believe that white is worse. Our king is a little bit weaker than black's, but black just doesn't have the material and the firepower to exploit it. Queen f6 is an excellent move. So uh, this has been a very humbling experience for me. But we go queen e2 defending the b2 pawn. And the reason I play queen e2 and not, let's say, rook b1 is because rook b1 would be very passive. Now, we can still try to win this. There's plenty of chess left to be played. I would be playing this for a win with black, obviously. White should not have any winning chances here if black plays this normally. But I've seen crazier things in my chess career. So we're gonna, I'm going to try to win this with white without doing anything crazy. Without doing anything crazy. So we could try to play rook. Yeah, e5 is another very good move because rook f1, queen c6 check is problematic. But let's do it anyway. Anonymous gifting to Stockfish. Yeah, very, very strong. I mean, I, I will say that when F takes E6 was played, I thought, okay, this is going to be a smooth game. But I greatly underappreciated that move. I greatly underappreciated the move F takes E6. So kudos to our opponent. You know, a, this is a positional misjudgment by me. I didn't realize how strong the pawn was. E4. Okay, probably our opponent is just playing for a win here. So now I also somehow underestimated this move. Okay, I guess we have to play b3 to solidify this pawn. Queen e6 check. Yeah, just getting crushed. Okay, let's think about this. Queen g4 maybe? Trying to play for a draw? No, this is simply bad. King g2, he has e3, which I... Fail to see. <laughs> I mean, I will have to go pawn down endgame and try to say and try to hold it. Have to go pawn down qu rook endgame. Only chance. Because king g2 e3, I think, was just losing. Maybe not, but I didn't want to get mated. 
This is borderline lost, but there are some drawing chances in the end game. Actually, there are good drawing chances. No, no, the end game actually might even be just a draw. I'm not sure, but I think it might just be a draw. And he doesn't... Wow. He goes through it. But, but if he gets over ambitious here, you know, you can lose control of a game like this pretty easily, actually. I'm stunned that our opponent didn't trade queens. Uh, let's think. Rook e1. I would, take, I would take the queen automatically. I'll put it that way. Let's try rook f5. Let's try rook f5. Yes, I see how much time he has. I mean, it doesn't take that much time to outplay me. <laughs> That's the lesson from this game. Queen e7. Queen f4. I'm teetering on the edge. Essentially, it's like the Dim Ding Nepo game. But people watching on YouTube, I'm recording this on the on the day of the tiebreaker in the World Championship. So in a, in a weird way, this game reminds me of Nepo Ding because Black has this passed pawn, and it may not seem very scary at first sight, but the path for this pawn is totally clear. And we really cannot afford to consign either of our pieces to a passive existence on like E2 because there's too many other problems to deal with other than the past pawn. So what we have to do is basically defend actively, by which I mean we have to find tactical methods of preventing the further progress of the pawn. I think the move here is queen to f4. This, I think, is a good defensive move because if black plays e3, I want to play rook e5 and prevent the further progress of the pawn. Rook e8. Yeah. Now we have to get behind the pawn with queen e3, I think. By the way, someone's number of games does not mean anything at all. But again, I don't see any reason to be suspicious. I just think he's playing a really good game. But I'll talk more after the game. So let's play queen e3. Let's focus on holding this. I think I can hold a draw at least if I'm accurate. I think I can hold a draw at least if I'm accurate. Now, if queen e6, then of course we want to go g4. And this you should understand. If queen e6, then, then we want to go g4. g4. But now I see that queen e6 was very good. Might be coming to an end. We'll see. Okay. Rook d8. Yeah. I'm I'm just I'm getting pushed off the board here. King g2. I have to step away with my king. I have to step away with my king. Rook d3. Queen f4. I'm still trying. Black can easily blunder mate there, by the way. Very easy to blunder some sort of rook f8 and queen f5. Lots of games have turned around in these heavy piece end games because one side just gets too, en too enamored with like pushing a pawn and, and, and leaves the king exposed or even allows a queen trade. And we would definitely benefit in the event of a queen trade, even at the cost of a pawn. Even at the cost of a pawn. Okay, no warrior score, by the way, if you're watching. I know the game just started, but you will get banned immediately if you share the warrior score. <laughs> so please do not share any numbers at all. Rook d1. So rook d... Wait a second. That actually looks like a very sloppy move to me. Rook f4. What am I missing? I mean, I surely I'm missing something because I, I get this sometimes. get this feeling of help, helplessness like... It's too good to be true, you know? I've been outplayed the whole game. It's funny, like, I um, had this with Super James. No, but he's he's going astray here. I think he's giving me... He's letting me off the hook pretty easy. He's focused on the wrong pawn. So the question now is, well, we have three things that we can do. If I want to get really gutsy, then we should play A4 and actually try to keep my queenside pawns. That's if I want to play for the win. Then I'll go A4. The problem with a4 is that he goes rook a2 check and I can very easily get mated. So I don't... The point of the speedrun is to do what I would do in a real game. And in a real game, I wouldn't even think about playing a4. I would immediately take on e4. And I'll show you some lines after the game that are scaring me. Now, what would I take on e4 with? Well, I would want to take with a piece that increases my chances of a queen trade because a queen trade is the fastest path to a draw from this position, if that makes sense. And to me, well, obviously that would be queen takes e4. Rook takes e4 would be the all-in move I would play in bullet. But rook take, I think rook takes e4 would be more appealing to some people because you see that you can deliver a check on e8. But if you look concretely after rook takes e4, black can play queen c6 and pin the rook against the king. Also, black will, of course, start by playing rook takes a2 check. 
And maybe there we could have played King H3. Yeah, maybe that was an interesting attempt to play for the win. I, I didn't appreciate that fully. Yeah, I, uh, but okay, it's fine. Okay, now King G3 or King... I didn't see that we could even go King H3. But here it doesn't make sense to go King H3 because if we're preparing for an end game, we want our king to be as close as possible to the center. So am I not afraid of queen to d6 here pinning the rook against the king? Okay, now it should be a draw, but that doesn't mean we can't win this. I've won some crazy end games before, and if our opponent gets very sloppy, this is a winnable position. Now, at this point, I'm going to try to play for a win. I'm going to try to do everything within my power to make our opponent go wrong. And the first thing I'm going to do is play the move c5, which is a very tricky move. And if black responds inaccurately, he is already in trouble. And he responds very accurately. I actually missed this move. Or does he? Yeah, he does. Okay, now let's go rook d4 and try to get the rook to the seventh. I completely missed a5. For some reason, I mean, it's a straightforward move because it prevents rook b4. And that's another very good move. Um, okay, so I guess I'm not out of the woods just yet. Let's, let's, uh, yeah, I'm still the one playing for a draw here. Because there's a crazy line, rook d6, rook a3, rook b6, a4. Yeah, this, this defensive task, it never ends. Yeah, I guess I'm still in trouble here. I'm just not used to this. Okay, king f4, I guess. It was not obvious at all, actually, a5. To stop like stop it like that with a pawn was 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 far from an obvious move. Far from an obvious move. I mean, the amount of things I feel like I'm missing in this game are like incredible. I, I it's hard to say if I'm playing terribly or if he's playing extremely well. Probably both. Okay, let's go rook d6. We'll see. We'll see. We'll check the accuracy and stuff. I mean, he has made mistakes. There's no question that he he, he has made mistakes. Obviously, he's made mistakes. Um, but overall, I've gotten totally outplayed here. King e5. Let's try to activate my king and get this rook to b6. In order to draw this... <sighs> okay. Yeah, I see where this is going. No, we're not drawing this, unfortunately. I didn't see this move either. Let's try this. Last, last hope. Last hope. I, I mean, if I can go c6, it's still, it still could be holdable against the, you know, a, a club player, but a GM should be able to beat me here. Rook d2, rook b2. That's maybe that's bad. No, let's think. Wait, that's probably not a good move. Rook d3. He allows me to step back with my rook in order to vacate a square for my king. So it's not over. It's far from over. Rook g2. Okay, now I just legitimately have to be very accurate. Okay, I guess rook d4 to defend. I mean, I cannot give away a second pawn. If I give away this pawn, then he gets connected passers and it's over. The game is over. The good thing is I don't have to wait very long for his move. So the torture won't last very long. Rook g3 b4. No, rook g3 b4. That's not winning. I mean, that's a trap that I laid. Of course, he's not going to fall for it. Maybe he will. We'll see. Rook g3, b4. I want to play. So I'll talk a little bit about the nature of like suspicion after the game. Right now, my verdict is that he is legit. And I would say, if I was suspicious, I have, I have said it before. I will say it again. I truly, genuinely think for now that he's playing honestly. He's just clearly, clearly underrated. Okay, so let's focus on trying to save this. But I'm not sure, of course. I'm not sure. It's entirely. I would not be surprised, but I don't believe he is. Uh, let's go king d6. I don't really know much about chess and people. So if you think you know better, then I guess you know better. Let's go king d6. I think this might be drawable, actually. Oh, but he finds king d8. That's a great move. I'm, I'm just getting this total feeling of hopelessness, which I shouldn't be getting, but I am getting it. I mean, c6 maybe is a draw? c6? 
Let me think. C6, B6, Rook A4 is an interesting idea, by the way. No, it should be a draw. Let's go C. Let's go C6. Yeah, he does find a lot of good moves. Okay, BC. Rook A4, King C8, King C6. Maybe it's lost. Okay. Hopefully he doesn't play King C8 and he gives me the check on D3. Then I have some maybe... Okay, does he give me the check on D3? Let's see why that is better. It should be a draw. I mean, there's there's no way this should be winning. Okay, let's go king b7 and then try to go b6. Now, wait a second. This, I, I mean, I know it's funny, but, you know, if he's not careful, I can play b6 and king a7 and b7. So I've seen many situations, many of these types of endgames where people just get super flustered and lose. Okay, that's a good move, I think. Okay, let's go here, actually. Very tricky move I'm going to make. King b8. The point is just to roll out the red carpet for the pawn. And the great thing about this for white is that once I get my pawn to b7, and I'm actually going to play for the win here. No, but it's... Once we get the pawn to b7, then this king on a7 is going to be unassailable because this rook on a4 is stopping black from delivering checks on the a file. I'm already playing for a win. I'm going to go king a6. Now, I think he... Obviously, black can draw this with super accurate play. I already think black is playing for a draw. And black has a very difficult move here. I see it. I think it draws. But this already might be the only move. And he doesn't play what I the move I thought it was. So now we go b6. And if king c8, king a7, and we're almost winning, it's probably still a draw, though. We're very close to being winning here. King a7, but probably, unfortunately, still a draw, Sag. Yeah, he finds it. He finds it. Okay, basically, actually, wait, maybe am I losing? No, I, I see a draw, I think. Check. Well, that move, obviously, wait a second. Wait up, wait up, wait up. Hold up. There's some cool lines here. Rook c1, a2. Nah, shoot. Doesn't work. I, I think I have to go b7 because if I go rook a4, he can actually start playing for a win with king c6. So I think I need to go b7. If my king was on a8, it would be winning. And he finds a2. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to find here. Yeah, and king c7. Perfectly executed. But this is a draw. Which I am very happy with, I have to say. I'm I'm proud to make this draw. Because this guy was an absolute monster. And we'll we'll check. I mean, obviously here we should analyze with the engine because okay, he's playing for it. Wait. Wait, let's not celebrate just yet. Now, wait a second. Did that lose? No, rook c1. He's got rook a3. Ugh, so close. Okay, but if he, go, if he gets too cute... Okay, draw. I guess it is a draw. It is a draw. Yeah, and he found only moves. Um, okay, GG. GG. The path forward from 2000 is, is filled with uh, trials and tribulations. All right, let's analyze. So we will check his accuracy, obviously not trying to imply anything just because people in the chat are curious. My accuracy was probably pathetic. It was 94.3 to 94.7. Okay, that's pretty high actually for both of us. So I did not play terribly. That's your answer to the question. I did not play terribly. Here's the proof. Okay, that is some high accuracy for sure. I feel like got a Komsky here. Now, a couple of words, because this is an extremely touchy subject. And people on YouTube, especially I've found, get, can get very emotional about 
the situation where a GM or somebody with a platform essentially just without proper judgment or consideration is essentially implying that if anybody lower rated than them beats them, their ego can't take it. And so by definition, someone is cheating. Now, here's what I have to say on that. Of course, when a GM is playing an FM in three plus zero, it's unacceptable to just go around and start throwing out accusations. Now, it's a different situation. The, more, the, the higher the rating disparity, the less likely it becomes that in a longer game, you know, for example, if a 1500 beats me in a 15 minute game and I'm playing completely seriously, by definition, that is probably suspicious unless I had a mouse slip or I blundered a queen. If I'm playing my strength for a 1600 or even a 2000 to play like a 2600 for the entirety of the game, if it's not some sort of opening theory, you know, or some forced draw, is suspicious by definition, which doesn't mean that the person is necessarily cheating. It's just statistically unlikely. Hopefully people can understand that phrase is not very controversial. So the game has to be investigated more carefully. If the accuracy is like 95%, you know, 2000s rarely attain that. So you have to take the game, consider the game very seriously. The other thing that struck out to me was how quickly my opponent was playing which was almost instantly. And the other thing that stuck out to me was the feeling I got that no matter what I did, my opponent had an accurate response prepared. So I definitely got those feelings. I'm not going to lie. I had those feelings of helplessness that I often get when I feel like I'm getting, you know, when I'm playing a guide. Um, so am I a little bit, just a little bit suspicious? Yes. And hopefully I don't get burned at the stake for saying that. It, would it be acceptable to just bury my opponent and say he's cheating for sure? More than unacceptable. Um, so hopefully we can we can tow that line and we can look at the game with an engine. And a couple of the critical moments, I want to see if, in fact, they were top engine moves. That's going to be the goal. And we're going to look at the game and try to learn from it. That's the main goal. It's no... Okay, I, I can tell that some people haven't listened to a single word that I said. Because you're saying, isn't statistically unlikely just a fancy way to name cheaters? No, it, statistically unlikely means statistically unlikely. It means it happens from time to time. But if it happens, it needs to be investigated carefully. That's all it means. And no, I know some people are going to be listening to this thing. Yeah, he actually thinks this guy cheated for sure. He's just putting on a face. No, I truly do not know. I promise. I swear. I, I honestly do not know what to think. You know, because part of me is saying, yeah, like I just got totally outplayed by 2000. The other part of me is like, I probably didn't play that well and get over it. Okay, here we go. So the opening we have faced before, bishop e2. This line with d4 has been played by a lot of GMs, but it's not particularly great. C5 is the top move. So C5 is the, uh, is the top engine choice. Apparently, this is the way to fight the line. See, I never knew that because in my day, everybody would play bishop f5. And then after knight f3, white is a modest, a small and modest advantage. So for the purpose, yeah, for the purposes of this analysis, I will turn on, I will turn on uh, the chess.com engine. All right. So you can see here that it's like 0.2. I mean, it's, it's a very modest advantage. It's a very modest advantage. But I like white's position. I mean, this is relatively easy to play. Castles, black can play knight before in such positions, but you can always go knight a3 and then chase the knight away with c3. Right? So c5 is a, is a great move here because it immediately contests white's center. Immediately contests white's center. So we decided on playing c4. The knight drops back to f6 and d5. Okay, so e6 is obvious and very good. Pawn takes e6. Yeah, so here I, I simply fail to understand that pawn takes c6 is so strong. Hopefully I can be forgiven for that. I operated out of general principles. I thought this was a very bad move because this pawn is very weak. I mean, just visually, it looks very ugly. But I think there are two factors that contributed to my misevaluation. The first one is what I mentioned in a bit, which is that black has this idea of ensconcing a knight on d4. And because we don't have an e pawn and because our c pawn is on c4, white is going to permanently have problems, sorry, White is going to permanently have problems with the d4 square. My bad. White is going to permanently have problems uh, with, the, with the d4 square. The second thing is, of course, the semi-open f-file, 
which I also experienced problems with. Much like in openings like the Vienna, you get the F file, which you can use to attack Black's King. And it's a one-way street because one side does have a pawn on the F file and the other side doesn't. And while not having a pawn on the F file can be considered a drawback, here our pieces are not active enough to punish Black for that. It's more of a strength. Uh, so Bishop takes E6, I correctly evaluated, and I thought that this was quite a bit better for White. Uh, and it is. I mean, we're going to play Bishop E3 and Queenside Castle, you know. But given how obscure Bishop E2 is, I really would doubt that this is theory. So our opponent plays F takes E6. Very instructive. Knight C6, Knight F3, Bishop E7, Castles, Castles. This is all very normal. Bishop to G5. Apparently already, you know, White is struggling to equalize. H6, good move. Bishop h4, and again, I completely admit, knight h5 to me was not intuitive at all, because in my eyes, black is essentially leaving himself with a bad bishop. What I fail to appreciate is that this knight coming to f4 is just an incredibly strong idea, best move. Bishop e7, queen e7, already probably white is slightly worse. So g3, I made a very good move here. Second move according to the engine. The top engine move here was bishop to d3. And bishop e4. So this is a little bit computerish, but keeping the bishop this way would have kept equality. So g3 is a move that we played essentially out of desperation because I was so worried about the knight coming into f4. Rook a d8, good move. Rook e1. Okay. And knight f6, another move that did not occur to me at all. Okay, I'm starting to get a little bit suspicious. I will be completely and totally honest here. But uh, knight f6 to me is not intuitive because I felt like black really wants to go knight f4. And also it's very important to foresee that after knight h4, black has knight to f4. Black has knight to f4. Yeah, because of the speed. That's why I'm a little bit suspicious. Because these moves are taking black 15 to 17 seconds. These are extremely high level moves. Bishop f1, bishop e8, queen c1, knight g4. Bishop g2. Oh, so knight d4 is the top move. Okay, knight d4, which I thought was a mistake, but of course, what do I know? Uh, takes, takes, knight e4. Bishop c6 is not accurate. Or it is accurate, sorry. It's one of the top moves. Uh, bishop c6 is, is a good move. Queen to d2. I mean, I'm defending very well. Now, here I think black made a mistake. Here, our opponent thought for a while, for two minutes... And made a serious mistake. Of course, the best move, as I had indicated, is knight g4 to e5. And the reason this move is so strong, the reason this move is so strong is because the knight is heading for f3. Now, why is knight f3 such a strong idea? Well, because it eliminates the only defensive piece on the king side. Here, for example, if white plays b3, and after knight f3 check, as you can see, this is a very nasty position. I would even estimate this as more than minus 0.7 because you can see how weak the light squares are on the king side. So very instructive retreating move, knight e5 and knight f3. Of course, if white tries to cover the f4, f3 square, then you give up a pawn on c4 and the knight jumps into e3. So it's a, it's a good idea to file into your mental directory. So bishop takes e4 kind of lets us off the hook. But then our opponent follows up very accurately, rook f2. Of course, I did not see uh, the fact that the knight is heading for c2. And I correctly decided to take on e3. Knight c2 here is winning for black. Rook e6, queen f8. And you're going to lose the rook on a1, and the pawn is just going to run forward. So this was the correct decision by me. But once again, I start getting outplayed. Queen e2, e5. Rook f1, queen c6, and already it's a little bit worse. King h3, e4. Yeah, b3, I'm still playing very accurately here. Queen g4, queen e5. Um, rook f5 is probably a step in the wrong direction. Now queen f4 is a slight inaccuracy because of rook e8. Now queen e6. Rook d8. Yeah, still I'm holding equality. I'm still playing almost perfectly. But somewhere here I made a mistake. Yeah, c5 is still equal, but I had to find b4. I didn't think b... Oh! I saw b4, which leads to immediate liquidation. But I forgot that after rook a4, instructive moment, 
BA obviously blunders the rook, but you get the rook onto a square with check. Then you play BA. Then you play BA. And uh, it's a draw. I mean, it's just, it's just mutual liquidation and a two-on-two -two when all is said and done. The point is I forgot that you can move the rook onto a defended square. Now, what was the idea of the move C5? I actually think this was a very ingenious research. Uh, research. Why did I say that word? <laughs> resource. Resource. Yeah, that's why, I, that's why I misspoke. I was like, what word was I planning to say? Okay, resource. Now it makes sense. Uh, it was an ingenious resource because if black plays rook b2, which I think is a move a lot of people would make, rook b4 and white wins a pawn. Like you defend and simultaneously you attack. And now you see why I put the pawn on c5 so that b6 can be met with cb. Same thing, by the way, after rook a3, you go rook b4 and white is already playing for a win. But somehow I forgot the black can just stop it with a5, rook d4, and another very I could king e8. Not king e7 as I would have played, but king e8, of course. King f4, rook h2, rook f2 check, rook c2. Rook b2 is an inaccuracy, I guess. Rook c3 was the move, which to me is pretty intuitive, rook c3. But I was planning king d6, and apparently black is close to winning here. Okay, uh, let's see if I defend it accurately. Rook b2, rook d3. Rook g2, rook g3, and already this lets me off the hook due to b4. Here, for sure, our opponent is. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is quite easy to draw at this point. But still, no, already, like, already black has to be very accurate. Black has to be very accurate here. Yeah, I mean, it was a game played on a grandmaster level by black. That's all I'm going to say. The game was played at a GM level. So if it's a smurf, then I believe it. If it's someone extremely underrated, I believe it. Otherwise, I don't really believe it. And of course, there are more advanced tools to checking. I would especially look at my opponent's other games, but the time consumption for such a game of this quality is crazy. I mean, the guy has to be ultra talented. He, let, he ended the game with 12-23. He really only thought on one move Funnily enough, that move was the only mistake of the game. Okay, there were some inaccuracies. Um, by the way, the reason you play king e8 here and not king to e7 is because, is because, well, his other games are on this level, clearly, is because here white plays rook d6. And the point is, after rook a3, rook b6, a4, rook takes b7 is a check. Now compare this to the king e8 line. I was wanting to play rook d6, but I realized that if you follow the same line, this is not a check. Black plays rook takes b3 check and wins the game on the spot because this forces a rook trade. And as a consequence, the pawn rolls down to promotion. So something that would probably take me, you know, a minute to appreciate. It took our opponent 15 seconds, but it's pretty consistent uh, with his play. If king e6 instead, this is even worse because here the rook gets to b6 with tempo. No, I'm sure. I mean, he's, if he's had an account for years, then he's legit. But it's just, I mean, again, hopefully even if you're my opponent and you're watching this, you, surely you can see why I'm starting to get suspicious about this game. A lot of games, a lot of moves on, on a super GM level for sure. So conclusions from this game. And we didn't analyze it quite as diligently as I normally would analyze the speedrun game. You know, sometimes this, this deflating feeling, it makes it hard for me to analyze. The rest of the games look nothing like this, apparently. Yeah. So first of all, D4, C5 was ultra accurate opening play. Ultra accurate opening play. Every move about 15 seconds. Then F takes C6 is a super GM move right here. I, it, this is a move that shows a very high level understanding of the position. Then, then, of course, super accurate play in the middle of the game. Knight h5 was a nice move. Rook d8, bishop e8. Knight g4, knight d4. I mean, just perfect play in the middle of the game. Then the one mistake, which was uh, not to play knight e5, which was to take on e4. But that was followed up by another ultra accurate sequence of moves. Like every one of these moves was the most testing. I held my ground very nicely, I thought. Until I played c5. This is where I started playing for a win. And the moment I start playing for a win, I get into some trouble. 
Black plays well. And of course, it would have been more trouble if Black had played in this position. Either king to e7, which to me was one of the most intuitive moves of the whole game. To just bring the king up and prevent White's king from accessing d6. But instead, rook b2 allowed us to drop the rook back to d3, which opened up more pathways for our king. And, okay, b4 was an accurate defensive move, and I was able to hold the game. Um, so I thought it was a well-defended game. I could feel pretty early that we were dealing with a very serious opponent. I had that feeling. You know, again, you know, when these come out on YouTube, there's always a buzz in the comments section. And there's always some people who are going to be like, who are going to feel like I'm unfairly judging my opponent or I'm not giving him the benefit of the doubt. I am. I'm not going to report him. I'm going to take a closer look at the game on my own. And if I feel that it's getting more and more obvious, then, you know, then I might. I, also, I'm doing a speed run and obviously I'm not, uh, you know, I'm also smurfing. So I don't think it's really my place to report people in the speed run. Uh, unless unless it's ultra blatant cheating. Okay. I hope you enjoyed the analysis. I'm going to get going and watch the game. I'm going to get going and watch the game. And uh, I might be back tonight. If I'm feeling energetic, I'll be back tonight. Thank you, everybody, for the support and for being very wholesome. Yanur with the 105 subs today. It was a massive sub day. So thank you, everybody. Uh, very, very much, particularly Yanur for all of your support through the months. And uh, Velvet Canyon, thank you for the five subs earlier as well. I will raid. Who will I raid? I will raid. Let's raid Kostya. Let's raid Kostya and, and keep the chess education content going. See you guys later. Uh, thanks again and goodbye.